This is the Sabbath School lesson for the fourth quarter, 2020. Lesson 5 for October 24 to 30, Jesus as the Master Teacher, read by Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, October 24. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that Jesus came to express your word in flesh. And as he taught, as he showed what the message was that you wanted us all to know and the people around him to know, we pray that the methods he used we may gain inspiration from and adapt them for use in our day and place. May we learn more about the lovely Jesus this week. We pray in his dear name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Second Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 6. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Let's read that again. Second Corinthians 4 verse 6. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Billy Graham tells the story of when he visited soldiers at a field hospital in the company of their general. One young soldier was so mangled that he lay face down on a canvas and steel contraption. A doctor whispered to Graham, I doubt he'll ever walk again. The soldier made a request of the general. Sir, I fought for you, but I've never seen you. Could I see your face? So the general got down, slid under that canvas and steel contraption, and talked with the soldier. As Graham watched, a tear fell from the soldier onto the general's cheek. At the time of Jesus' birth, humanity lay mangled and bleeding, in need of a healing vision of God. It is as though humankind pleaded, O oh God, could we see your face? In sending his son to this planet, the father sent the master teacher on a mission to show humankind his face. Ever since, we have had the wondrous privilege of beholding the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 6. As we watch the Master Teacher make his way to earth, what can we learn from him? Sunday, October 25, Revealing the Father Question, what are the most important points the Apostle makes about Jesus at the beginning of the Epistle to the Hebrews, as we find in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 to 4? God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he is appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who, being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. New Testament authors repeatedly accent a significant idea. Jesus comes to earth to show human beings who the Father is. In past times, God's revelation came in a fragmented way through the prophets. In Jesus, however, the final and complete revelation of God has come. Also, in his person, Jesus is the reflection of God's glory in verse 3. As sinful humans, we could not endure full access to the glory of God. As the incarnate Son, Jesus reflects that glory. It is muted in Christ's humanity, so that we might see it and understand clearly the character of God. Jesus also is, as it says in verse 3, the express image of his person. 
The term used here, the Greek word character, is sometimes used as the impression a seal makes in wax or the representation stamped on a coin. So, Jesus is the exact imprint of God's very being, as it reads in the NRSV of Hebrews 1 verse 3. If we wish to know the Father, we must listen carefully to what the Master Teacher says about Him. And we must watch the Master Teacher as well. The Father is seen in the Son. Question. Compare Hebrews chapter 1 verses 1 to 4 with 2 Corinthians 4 1 to 6. In 2 Corinthians 4 1 to 6, who is Jesus and what do we learn from Him? So let's read Hebrews 1, 1 to 4 again. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. And then we compare it with Second Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 to 6. Therefore, since we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we do not lose heart. But we have renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your bondservants for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who was shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. As they educated others about God, Paul and his co-workers sought to reflect Jesus' own teaching ministry about the Father. As the image of God, as it said in 2 Corinthians 4 verse 4, Jesus brought us knowledge about God the Father. Similarly, Paul avoids deception and distortion of God's word and instead sets forth the truth plainly in verse 2. But we have renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness, not handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Just as God at creation used light to dispel darkness, he has given us his Son to dispel false views about him and to show us the truth about God. It is in the face of Jesus that we gain the clearest knowledge of God. As it said in verse 6, For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who was shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So, to finish today, Jesus accurately reflected the Father, something we too are called to do since we are invited to be imitators of God as dear children, as it reads in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 1. What does that mean? And what can we learn from Jesus about how to be imitators of God? Monday, October 26, Revealing the Father Continued In the moving prologue to his Gospel, John 1, 1 1-18, John discusses Jesus as the Eternal Word. Let's read all of that, just so we have the context. 
John chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There was a man sent from God, whose name was John. This man came for a witness, to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth." John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness we have all received, and grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. John's claims for Jesus are not timid or limited. They are bold and cosmic in nature. Jesus was in existence before the world came into being, from eternity actually. In fact, Jesus is the agent of creation, as we read in verses 2 and 3. He is the light of all people, we read in verse 4. And as the word who came into the world, he enlightens everyone, as it reads in John chapter 1, verse 9. According to John, what is the result of Christ's becoming a human being? As the word, what light did he bring? What qualifications does he possess to do so. And we've read those verses, verse 14 again, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And verse 18, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. We read in the book Education by Ellen White, pages 74 to 76, The light appeared when the world's darkness was deepest. There was but one hope for the human race, that the knowledge of God might be restored to the world. Christ came to restore this knowledge. He came to set aside the false teaching by which those who claimed to know God had misrepresented him. He came to manifest the nature of his law, to reveal in his own character the beauty of holiness. End of quote. Everything Jesus did in his life on earth had a single purpose, as we read in page 82 of the same book, the revelation of God for the uplifting of humanity. And question. Jesus himself says, Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. That's John 14 verse 9. What was the setting of Jesus' statement, and why did he make it? Let's read that in John 14, verses 1 to 14. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go you know, and the way you know. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, and how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also, and from now on you know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, Show us the Father? 
Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you I do not speak of my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do, because I go to my Father. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. It is tempting to criticise Philip's blundering statement in John 14, verse 8. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. After years of close fellowship with Jesus, he still misses the essential point of the Incarnation, that Jesus has come to show the Father's character. Perhaps teachers today can take some comfort in the fact that one of the master teacher's pupils performed so badly. Philip's statement is probably recorded, though, not to give us reason to criticise him, but to give us opportunity to examine ourselves. How long have we walked with Jesus, and have we understood Jesus any better than Philip had? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father, Jesus said. Tuesday, October 27. Reading the Master Teacher's Mind. Question. What concern about the Christian community in Philippi is on Paul's heart as he writes his letter to them in Philippians chapter 2 verses 1 to 4 and Philippians chapter 4 verses 2 and 3? Let's start with Philippians chapter 2 verses 1 to 4. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ... If any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out, not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. And Philippians chapter 4, verses 2 and 3. I implore Iodia and I implore Synthi to be of the same mind in the Lord. And I urge you also, true companion, help these women who laboured with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and the rest of my fellow workers, whose names are in the book of life. Philippians chapter 2 verses 1 to 11 is one of the most profound passages in all the Bible. It discusses the pre-existence of Christ, his divinity, his incarnation, his humanity, his acceptance of death on the cross. It describes the long, difficult downward road that Jesus took from heaven to Calvary in Philippians 2, 5 to 8. And it describes how the Father exalts Jesus to a position of universal worship in verses 9 to 11. A lot of tantalizing truth is packed into these verses. Question, how does Paul introduce Philippians 2, 5 to 11? Of the events of Jesus' life that he celebrates, which ones do you think he expects believers to reflect in their own lives? Philippians chapter 2 and verses 5 to 11. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross." 
Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Paul hopes that the believers at Philippi, who could be argumentative, will learn from Jesus and his incarnation. If Jesus could adopt human form, the form of a slave being born in human likeness, in verse 7, and even submit to crucifixion, how much more should they submit to each other out of love? We are reminded that there is much to learn from the master teacher, Jesus. We learn from the messages that he shares during his earthly ministry. We learn from the miracles that he performs and the way that he acts towards others. We may seek to model our own relationships with others after his great condescension and by dwelling on his willingness to exchange the glories of heaven for a manger. What a lesson for us. In contrast, the world all too often invites us to exalt ourselves, to boast of our accomplishments. At a manger in Bethlehem, and from the master teacher, we learn a different lesson, that God's great work of education and salvation is accomplished not by exalting ourselves, but by humbling ourselves before God and becoming servants to others. So, to finish today, what situation are you facing? even now, in which your humbling yourself could give you a powerful opportunity to reflect Christ to others. Wednesday, October 28, The Master Teacher and Reconciliation Human relationships all too often break down. We become estranged from one another. The person who was once our close friend becomes over time someone we distrust. However, such a broken relationship can be mended. When that happens, we experience the wonder of reconciliation Few human experiences are as sweet as this. Question, how does reconciliation lie at the heart of Christ's incarnation and his role as master teacher? Let's read 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 16 through 21. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteous of God in him. If we feel blessed when a relationship with another human being is restored, how grand should we feel when we are reconciled to God? In 2 Corinthians 5, 16-21, Paul is clear about who is doing the reconciling. God the Father has taken the lead in mending our broken relationship with Him, and He has done this reconciling work through Christ in verse 18. God was in Christ reconciling the world to Himself in verse 19. Again, though, we are not simply to be consumers of the joys of reconciliation. We are to learn from the Master Teacher. In His incarnation, Jesus participated in the work of reconciliation. And we, too, are invited to participate in it. 
God has reconciled us to himself through Christ, and now we, with Paul, are given the ministry of reconciliation. Verse 18. Colossians 1, 15-20 is another of the great New Testament passages on Christ's incarnation. Often thought to be a hymn, the first half of the passage discusses Christ's role in creation, in verses 15-17, to 17, while the last half focuses on Christ's role in redemption, in verses 18-20. to 20. Let's read that. First, uh, Colossians chapter 1 and verses 15 to 20. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of the cross. Through Christ's role as Creator Redeemer, God reconciles all things to Himself. The work of reconciliation that God accomplishes through Christ is cosmic in scale, impacting all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of His cross. Verse 20. While we could never match the cosmic scale of the Master Teacher's work as reconciler, we are invited to participate in the ministry of reconciliation in our own sphere in verse 18. Could this be what was in Jesus' mind when he prayed in John seventeen eighteen, As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. So to finish today, what are practical ways we can reflect God's rule as reconciler? That is, in what situation right now, if any, can you help people be reconciled with each other? Thursday, October 29. The Master Teacher's First Pupils One moment they are a band of ordinary shepherds caring for an average flock of sheep outside a small town. In the next moment they are the recipients of an amazing appearance of angels who bear startling, wondrous, world-shattering news. Motivated by that appearance, they seek out the child whom the angels announced. Question. Imagine standing with the shepherds and gazing into the manger. What would you see? Luke 2, beginning at verse 8. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Saviour, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, good will toward men. So it was, when the angels had gone away from them into heaven, that the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in the manger. Now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child, and all those who heard it marvelled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. 
Then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told them. We must admire the first pupils of the master teacher, Joseph and Mary and the shepherds. The humble conditions of Jesus' birth give no indication of the wonder of the Incarnation, that, in the person of this infant, God has become one with humankind. However, with the aid of visions, dreams and angels, those first students of his are able to look beyond the outward appearance of Jesus' birth. The shepherds share with others the identity of this infant, that he is a Saviour who is the Messiah the Lord, that's verse 11 of Luke chapter 2. And verse 17 in Luke chapter 2 says, Now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. Question, how do the wise men respond to the news of the birth of Jesus? How does Herod respond? Matthew 2 verses 1 to 12. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the young child, and, when you have found him, bring back word to me, that I may come and worship him also. When they heard the king, they departed, and, behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them, till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Then, being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed to their own country another way. Before he has spoken his first parable, or performed his first miracle, the master teacher is worthy of our worship because of who he is. To fully appreciate the later teaching ministry of Jesus, we must join these early pupils, the wise men, in their worship of the master teacher. The one whose teachings we admire is more than a wise educator. He is God come to dwell with humankind. Christian education is rooted in the worship of Christ. With these men, shepherds and angels, we are called to worship Christ, the newborn King, and to see in the infant Jesus the reality of God himself. So, to finish today... Think about what the incarnation of Jesus means regarding the character of God. The creator of all the universe, which is so big that we cannot grasp it, this God humbled himself by coming into humanity, living as Jesus, and then dying on the cross, bearing in himself the punishment for our sins. Why is this such good news? Friday, October 30. From the book Education, page 83, we read, In the teacher sent from God, all true educational work finds its centre. Of this work today, as verily as of the work he established 1800 years ago, the Saviour speaks in the words, I am the first and the last, 
and the Living One, Revelation one seventeen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, Revelation 21, verse 6. In the presence of such a teacher, of such opportunity for divine education, what worse than folly is it to seek an education apart from him, to seek to be wise apart from wisdom, to be true while rejecting truth, to seek illumination apart from the light and existence without the life, to turn from the fountain of living waters and hew out broken cisterns that can hold no water. Behold, he is still inviting. If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of him shall flow rivers of living water. The water that I shall give him shall become in him a well of water springing up into eternal life. John seven thirty seven and 8 and John 4 verse 14. End of quote. And from the same book, page 282, Dear Teacher, as the highest preparation for your work, I point you to the words, the life, the methods of the Prince of Teachers. I bid you consider him. Here is your true ideal. Behold it, dwell upon it, until the spirit of the Divine Teacher shall take possession of your heart and life. Reflecting as a mirror the glory of the Lord, you will be transformed into the same image. 2 Corinthians 3.18 This is the secret of power over your pupils. Reflect Him. And that brings us to our three discussion questions for this week. 1. What values and actions would be important to Christian teachers and students who take seriously the idea of learning from the incarnation of the Master Teacher? 2. Christian parents and teachers have a high standard to reflect the character of God as revealed in the incarnation of Jesus. What should we do when we fall short of this high standard? 3. In class, discuss the question at the end of Thursday study, What does the birth, life and death of Jesus teach us about the character of God? Why should this be so comforting to us, especially during times of great trial? Inside Story Our mission story this week is titled Finding Freedom in Rwanda and it's by Lucette Ndai Mitrak. I don't know why I volunteered to preach at Total Member Involvement Evangelistic Meetings in Rwanda in May 2016. Other than me, only young people volunteered to preach when coordinator Dwayne McKay invited our Seventh-day Adventist Church in Paris to participate. I was weak after a long illness, and my 23-year-old son recently had committed suicide. But I signed up and quickly was asked to supervise the young people, not to preach. Things changed after our arrival in Nyanza in Rwanda. We met with the local pastors, and I was asked to preach. I fled to my hotel room and fell on my knees. Lord, I have never preached, I prayed. But since you said it is not by might nor by power, but by your Spirit, please speak instead of me. Starting with the first evening meeting, childhood memories flooded my mind as I spoke about the transforming power of the Gospel. Rwandans had suffered horrific rape and violence during 1990s genocide. I had gone through similar trials and spoke from my heart. Every time I made an altar call, people were moved, especially women who had been raped. Many came to the front. The more I spoke, the more I was healed. Although I had given my heart to Jesus many years earlier, I realized that I still held a grudge. I knew that God had not deprived me of my childhood and my mother, but I still blamed him. My stepfather used to rape me. I only told my mother when I was 13. She took me to a gynaecologist and sent me to live with a cousin. Shortly afterward, she visited me on a Friday. I never saw her again. My stepfather killed her. 
My stepfather spent only two years in prison because he was a high-ranking military officer. I lived in an orphanage from the age of 13 to 19. My biological father was alive, but he didn't want anything to do with me. I felt lonely. I found healing in the Bible. I read the following verses from Zephaniah 3.17 and Zechariah 2.8 and Jeremiah 31 verse 3. The Mighty One will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He who touches you touches the apple of his eye. The Lord has appeared of old to me, saying, Yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. But I didn't love myself. Even if people told me that I was pretty, I didn't feel pretty inside. In Rwanda, the dark negativity faded as I spoke. I knew it wasn't me preaching. I found freedom and accepted Christ's loving declaration that I am a wonderful creature. A total of 390 people were baptised at Sagira's Seventh-day Adventist Church. Today I am 66, and I have returned to Rwanda many times. My Rwandan friends are my family, and they call me Mama. I am working now, so many people will become new creatures in Christ. And there's a lovely photo of her smiling here on the left. Thank you for your Sabbath School mission offerings that help spread the gospel around the world. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind and Hearing Impaired, Christian Record Services for the Blind, the Sabbath School Department and Hope Channel. You can also listen on the official Sabbath School 4 app and the Apple iTunes app, Sabbath School with Percy Harold. Remember, God is always faithful.